Tonight we'd like to present to you the biblical view of the pre-existence question. The pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ prior to his birth to his mother Mary. The phrase the pre-existence of Christ is a term that describes a doctrine that the teachers teach that the teachers teach us today to describe Lord Jesus Christ existing prior to his natural birth to Mary. Wikipedia has uh, the doctrine of pre-existence as this way. He says, the doctrine of the pre-existence of Christ asserts the ontological or personal existence of Christ before his conception. Now, there are two views of this doctrine. The first view is the Trinitarian view, and we'll come across that in a minute. The other view, of course, is the non-Trinitarian view, and as the name suggests, those who believe this doctrine do not believe in the Trinity. However, they believe that the Lord Jesus Christ existed prior to his birth to his mother Mary. The Jehovah Witnesses, for example, hold the non-Trinitarian view. They believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was the archangel Michael, prior to coming to earth to assume his mortal body on earth. The Trinitarian view, on the other hand, is a view that is held by the mainstream Catholic churches, although not exclusively. And however, they teach the doctrine primarily to support the doctrine of the Trinity. And the reason they do that, ladies and gentlemen, is because if you do not believe in the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ... You cannot believe in the Trinity. It is simply an impossibility. The doctrine of the Trinity has been around since about the 3rd century AD. The first recorded instance of the word Trinity in church literature was found in a document written by a Latin theologian by the name of Catullian. He is credited with being the first person to use the Latin words Trinity person and substance to explain their Trinitarian idea of a Godhead. And so the doctrine of the Trinity has been around for a long period of time. So what is the doctrine of the Trinity? The doctrine of the Trinity essentially puts God forward as three distinct beings dwelling co-eternally as one God and yet three gods. And up on the screen I have the Athanasian Creed and it says this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit, the Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. It is a doctrine, ladies and gentlemen, that is just utter confusion. It is a doctrine that is not supported by the Bible. In fact, you can go right throughout the whole Bible, cover to cover, and you will not find the word Trinity anywhere within its pages. Nowhere. Yes, you'll find it in church literature if you go looking, but you will not find it in the Bible. The Bible simply does not agree with this man-made doctrine, and so it generally goes that when you tell one lie... You have to tell a number of other lies to support the story that you concocted in the first place to make it sound plausible or to make it stack up. And so the Trinity is contradictory and confusing in nature. However, that doctrine requires a number of things to be true in order for it to stack up. 
And for any doctrine to be true, ladies and gentlemen, it must be supported and proved from the word of God or the Bible. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, that is the word of God. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So let's have a look at these things and see if the things that this doctrine requires agree agrees with the word of God. And so the Athanasian dependencies are these. It depends on God being capable of temptation. It depends on, being, on God being capable of death. And it depends on the Lord Jesus Christ being existent before his own birth. So let's take them one at a time. I'd like you to come with me to uh, Luke chapter 4. And we read there in Luke chapter 4 and at verse 1 it says, And Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit returned from Jordan, this was after his baptism, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, just having been baptised in the previous chapter, is led out in the wilderness to be tempted. And Luke chapter 4 goes on to enumerate the three temptations that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ responded to each of those temptations through reciting scripture back to the tempter. But here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. If Christ is God, as is put forth in the Trinitarian view, how was it that he was tempted? Can God be tempted? James chapter 1 and verse 13 says this, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. Remember, if they speak not according to this word, then there is no light in them. Here is the word of God directly rebutting this requirement. The Athanasian uh, Creed requires that God is capable of death. And why is, that necessary? why is that a necessary requirement of the Trinity? Well, according to the Trinitarian, God, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are all part of the Godhead. We've got to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the Lord Jesus Christ was born of a woman. He was born of his mother Mary and was therefore mortal and partook of his mother's flesh nature. And when you were mortal, ladies and gentlemen, you died. No other, no other person has ever stepped foot on this earth who has not died. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. He was put to death on the stake. So can God actually die? 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17 says, Now unto the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. If God's immortal, God cannot die. It's an impossibility. So that doesn't stack up either. Although they will say, they'll, they'll try and get around that by saying, well, look, no, um, God's not dying. He just separates from his mortal body and floats off somewhere else. That's not supported by the Bible either. It's actually called the immortality of the soul. We don't have time to go into that tonight. But God cannot die. He is immortal. And so we have this confused sort of situation where nothing is making sense. Turn with me to... Micah chapter 5. I have up on the screen for you Micah chapter 5 and at verse 2 verses. 
which I have done that because I have a couple of other translations which I'm going to put up there to compare for you. But Micah chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, speaking of the little town of Bethlehem, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been founded from of old, from everlasting. And so here we have the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ prophesied. How do we know that? Well, come with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The very first book of the, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born of the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, the prophet Micah. And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. And so we know that the prophet Micah is prophesying the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so back in Micah chapter 5, it goes on to tell us that the Lord Jesus Christ is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so the proponents of the pre-existence of Christ are going, aha, there you go, see? The Lord Jesus Christ has been from everlasting. So he must have pre-existed. Well, that's what it appears like on the surface. You see, the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, did not originate in the English language. It had to be translated from the Hebrew and the Greek languages, and the Old Testament was translated from the Hebrew. And when we look at the Hebrew for the words goings forth, it is the Hebrew motsah, M-O-W-T-S-A, A-H. And it means origin. And it has the idea of family descent. Ladies and gentlemen, that changes the whole meaning of that verse. It's not telling us that Christ has existed from everlasting or from eternity. What it is saying is that his family origins can be traced right back to the beginning. If you care to take a look at the the Gospel of Matthew in the first chapter at your leisure, you will find the genealogies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they go back right back to Abraham. And elsewhere in scriptures, you can take it back to Adam. And who created Adam? Well, that was God. And God toils from eternity to eternity. And all of a sudden, that verse makes a whole lot more sense. In fact, if you have a look at the RSV or the Revised Standard Version, it makes that verse much clearer by giving the sense of the original Hebrew. And I've got it up there on the, on the uh, overhead for you. And it says, Now you are walled about with a wall. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike upon the cheek of the ruler of Israel. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from old. From ancient days. The NIV. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And so these verses in Micah chapter 5 do not support the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like you to come with us to John chapter 1. The reading which we had this evening 
In John chapter 1, we can very easily get the wrong idea if we're not careful. We need to read the Bible carefully, ladies and gentlemen. There are some sections of the Word of God that are not easy to understand. However, that does not mean we just wipe them off as a so-called mystery. These passages are part of the Word of God and are very important for us to understand. The main problem we come across in John chapter 1 is we don't, or people don't understand the subject. The subject of John chapter 1 is the Word. The word here in the uh, authorised version is the Greek word logos, L-O-G-O-S. And it means the outward expression of inward thought or reason, the declaration by which this is revealed. It doesn't just signify the spoken word, but also the thought expressed by the word. And so we have the word or the logos in John chapter 1 and at verse 1, and from that word came life and light. And then ultimately came the true light. And that is the key to the problem. There are actually two lights in John chapter 1 that are being spoken about. We have the light and we have the true light. And we will see that as we make our way through the early verses of the chapter. And so we learn that in the beginning there was expressed reason or purpose. We see that in uh, John chapter 1 and at verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And so we learned that in the beginning there was expressed reason or purpose. And up on the overhead here I have um, the word word highlighted just so that we don't get ourselves confused when we mention the word word. It means the Greek word logos, okay? It is the outward expression of inward thought or reason, the declaration by which this is revealed. And down below in, in verse 3... We have all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And this is where the confusion comes in, ladies and gentlemen, because people think that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not. It's talking about the word. That word is in the masculine gender. And in actual fact, it should be in the neuter gender. And so we should read that all things were made by it. And without it was not anything made that was made. In it was life. And the life was the light of men. And you can see that in some other translations as well. So I have up on the screen what is known as the diaglot version. The diaglot version is basically a translation from the direct Greek text. And when we read it from the diaglot version, it makes a lot more sense for us. It says, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. This was in the beginning, with God, and we'll see that in a moment. Through it was everything was, sorry, through it everything was done, and without it not even one thing was done which has been done. And in it was life, and the life was the light of men. And all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, the, the verse has a totally different meaning. And so God created the heaven and the earth as a part of his expressed purpose. Come with me to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we have for us the creation account. And it says in verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. 
and there was light. You go through, ladies and gentlemen, Genesis chapter 1. And you take note of every time that it says, and God said. We have a declaration of his purpose. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, and it was so, and God said, and it was so, and so on and so forth. But what I want you to also notice, in verse 14, we're talking about day four in the, in the creation account, and it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. But he's already created the light on day one. Well, on day one, God created the light and he introduced the light into the world. On day four, he created the true light. You see, the sun represents the Lord Jesus Christ and the moon represents the church, or more correctly, the ecclesias, which in turn represented the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was day four. The Lord Jesus Christ was born about 4,000 years after creation. And so in the beginning we have the light. In 4,000 years' time we have the Lord Jesus Christ, or the true light. That's what it's being talked about in John chapter 1. And so we have the Bible proving its own doctrines, helping us to understand its message. And when you want to study the Bible, best practice is to let the Bible interpret itself. Let the Bible explain itself and comment upon itself because the author is God, don't forget. He knows what he has written and what he means by it. And so back in John chapter 1 we find that all things were not made by the Lord Jesus Christ. They were created as a part of the purpose that God has with the earth. I want to have a look at another look at a sorry, I want to have a look at another passage of scripture. I want you to come to Colossians chapter 1. This is another passage of scripture that is presented in support of this theory of the pre-existence of Christ. We read there in Colossians chapter 1 and at verse 15 where it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And so here we have, ladies and gentlemen, a, a, another passage of, of the word of God that is presented to us in support of this theory of the pre-existence of Christ and we want to know, did Christ create these things? Well, up on the screen in verse 15, we have that he is the firstborn of every creature. The firstborn of every creature. It's actually self-contradictory. You see, firstborn. First, as in the first in time. The first one to open the womb. And then you've got born, and so this requires a birth, inferring that you need a mother. She was a human being. So it can't mean, in a literal sense, that Christ was the firstborn of every creature that's been created out there. Well, the firstborn is actually a legal status. In fact, you have the law of the firstborn. That's given for us back in Exodus chapter 13 and at verse 2. And God is telling us there, he's saying unto the people, sanctify or separate unto me all the firstborn. Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast. And so God is saying to the children of Israel, I want everyone who has opened the womb first. I want them. Well, those men acted as priests on behalf of the families of Israel. It was a position of honour. 
We have examples of the men acting as priests back in Exodus chapter 24. However, Israel then fell into apostasy when Moses entered the mount. And so when Moses returned, he asked, and he, and he saw the people in apostasy, he said, who was on Yahweh's side? And the Levites came forward and stood for the things of God. And so God bestowed a blessing on the tribe. And we see that on the overhead. I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn. Therefore the Levites shall be mine. They are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel instead of such as open every womb, instead of the firstborn. Even instead of the firstborn, all the children of Israel have I taken them unto me. And so what you have, ladies and gentlemen, is the Levites have been elevated to this status of firstborn. It wasn't theirs in terms of the time period in which they were born. They weren't the first to open the womb. They were elevated to the status instead of all the firstborns. You have Abraham, who was a young son that was elevated as firstborn over his brethren. You have Isaac, Isaac who was a younger son elevated as, as, as firstborn over Ishmael. You have Jacob. We all know what happened in that story. You have Joseph, who was elevated above his brethren in Egypt. David was elevated over his older brethren. All of them appear in the Bible as representations of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Samuel, chapter 7. We read there in verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, that's another term for when thou wilt die and thou art buried with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. So this is talking about David's kingdom is going to be set up forever. And who's going to sit on the throne of that kingdom? None other but the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to come to Psalm 89, which is a messianic psalm based on this promise. Psalm 89. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my firstborn, higher than those of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Verse 27, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, And I will make him my firstborn. All the worthies of old, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the brethren of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were older than he was. And so Christ was the younger son, and here he is being elevated to the status of firstborn, above all the kings of the earth. I was telling all those who read his word that that was his intention. When he showed us through Jacob, when he showed us through Abraham, Moses, David, that that is what he wanted to do. He had it played out in their lives. Just as ladies and gentlemen, what we have found is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be elevated to the firstborn. He is not the firstborn of every creature that has been created out there. It is a status. And it is the status that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be promoted to in the time to come. So as Christadelphians, ladies and gentlemen, what is it that we believe? We believe the biblical account of creation. 
which teaches us how that light was introduced to the earth. How that that light pointed forward to the true light that was to become when the Lord Jesus Christ was born to his mother Mary 2,000 years ago. We believe that that man was crucified 33 years later. We believe that he was resurrected from the grave three days after that. And he ascended into heaven 40 days after that again. And we are waiting for him to return to the earth. In fact, come with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Bind two angels stood by them in white apparel, verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return again to this earth. Why? Well, come with me to Revelation chapter 22. The Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 22 through the pen of John says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work <coughs> shall be. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, ladies and gentlemen, he is going to give to all those people who have been found worthy the reward of eternal life. And through that means he is creating an immortal family. That is the creation that is being talked about in 1 Colossians chapter 1. It is a spiritual creation. And you and I have a chance to be a part of that creation. Come with me to Mark chapter 16. We can be a part of this creation, ladies and gentlemen. We can be a part of that in the time to come. But there are some things we must do first. In Mark chapter 16... In verse 15 he says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus Christ did not exist prior to his birth to his mother Mary. But when he was born, he went through his ministry, he was crucified, he was resurrected to life again, ascended into heaven, that he might return with his reward. And it is that reward that I beseech you to look into, because you have a chance, along with each and every, every one of us, to be a part of that reward. 